the cones of using vasopressin and septic shock. And uh, my uh, talk will include uh, those points. I will be talking about the BAS trial and the, the primary hypothesis behind the BAS trial. I'll be talking about steroids and vasopressin benefits of lower catecholamine doses or the allergic benefits of lower catecholamine doses, hyponatremia, adverse effects, and a quick summary. As you can see, there's a lot of, a lot of overlap between the two talks, but I'll be talking about them from a different perspective. So I will start my talk by mentioning the BAS trial hypothesis, and BAS trial arguably is the uh, major advocate for using vasopressin in patient with septic shock, and I will be pointing out a couple of short terms that I've noticed in the study. And if you look at the original study design, uh, um, Vastrel looked, the primary hypothesis of Vastrel was that vasopressin compared to norepinephrine would actually decrease 20-day mortality from 60% to 50%. This was the, this, the statistical hypothesis behind that trial itself, which we, as already know, it actually failed to prove. There was no statistically significant difference between the two arms of the study um, in mortality at 28 days or 90 days. Now, this is shown by the graph that was shown by my colleague, the uh, uh, survival curve uh, at 28 days and as well as on 90 days, you can see there was no statistically significant difference in mortality between the both arms. Um, this is just um, a descri uh, describing the figure that we already saw, 35% versus 39% in, in 28 20 day mortality, 43% uh, for 49%, or again, no statistically significant difference, and there was no difference as well in organ dysfunction rates in both groups. Uh, it is uh, worth mentioning that the overall mortality rate for both arms was considerably lower in past study than previously reported. The uh, theory behind that was that mortality rate would be around 50 and 60 percent, which in the study was 37 percent. It's probably of unknown significance, but it's just worth mentioning. Now, a secondary hypothesis of the best trial was there was effective vasopressin compared with norepinephrine would be more pronounced in patients with more severe septic shock. That's how they started the study, uh, and that's how they built their uh, statistical analysis. However, we do know that the results came out actually on the other end. Vasopressin was found to have a better outcome in patients with less severe septic shock. So the original hypothesis behind the best trial wasn't actually proved at best trial. It was more of a secondary outcomes that were actually reported. And um, the theory behind having vasopressin uh, working in more severe septic shock, which again, the best trial was built around, is that we have a relative deficiency of vasopressin um, in late stages of septic shock. Originally, as my colleague pointed out, in normal individuals, there is very little uh, vasopressin. Early in the septic shock, you have very high levels of vasopressin. And then as sepsis, in, as sepsis goes on, and as we have more severe sepsis in septic shock, the levels decline, so we have a relative deficiency, and that's the theory behind the benefit of vasopressin. Um, however, this physiology is actually not proven by the study. It's actually quite the opposite. The physiology would suggest that with more severe septic shock, you have a more relative deficiency of vasopressin, and you would benefit. The study itself pointed out to the opposite fact, that the more severe the septic shock, you actually do not have that much evidence of vasopressin. So although there is a statistical significant, statistically significant difference, it doesn't really um, make sense in terms of physiology. It actually goes quite opposite to the physiology. Now, in Vastarial, vasopressin was used as a catecholamine sparing agent, meaning all patients were on catecholamine, they were all requiring high, or they were requiring high doses, some of them, and vasopressin was used as catecholamine sparing agent, not as a primary agent. As we all know, cate high catecholamine doses are usually used in more severe septic shock, and vasopressin was not found to be beneficial in, high, in patients who met those criteria and it was only beneficial in patients with less severe septic shock. So again, it goes against physiology in a way. Now, if we're not using it as a catecholamine sparing agent, can we use it as a primary agent? And not a lot of data on that, but we do know that there are some studies. There's one uh, retrospective single-centered study that I found that was published back in 2004. About 150 mm -hmm. patients who had septic shock received norepinephrine, vasopressin, or dopamine. So they were divided into three groups and each one of these groups received one of those um, vasoactive agents, and there was no significant difference in mortality, as you can uh, see down all the way to the end. Oh, sorry, I got something stupid. 
as you can see, there was no uh, difference in the mortality at 28 days. It was 52%, 65%, 60% with no statistical difference. Um, I will be talking about steroids and vasopressin, which as was pointed out, it's a post hoc analysis um, of the data that was originally published in uh, the vast trial by the same author, James Russell, in 2009. In the group that received corticosteroids, so they looked at the data and from a different perspective. They looked at all the patients. They divided them into patients who actually did receive corticosteroids and patients who did not receive corticosteroids, and then they looked at the different characteristics of those patients, and in the patients who actually received corticosteroids, vasopressin did reduce mortality at 28 days, as was pointed out. However, in the group of patients that did not receive corticosteroids, mortality was increased in the vasopressin group as opposed to the norepinephrine group, and this can be shown by the comparing the two survival curves. Um, the upper one is the patients with corticosteroids, the lower one without corticosteroids, and there is a statistically sign significant difference between both groups. Now, it is uh, worth mentioning, though, that the administration of steroids was not part of the original protocol of the study, so it was just left up to the judgment of the attending who was in taking care of the patient at the time, and hence we don't really know how and when and wh how did they administer it, and whether there was certain criteria that was met or not. It was just by a byproduct of post hoc analysis afterwards. Now, why is this, why, this, why does this, this doesn't make sense? Because if you look at those numbers, you would conclude probably that using steroids, um, what we do know from our practice that we use steroids for more severe septic shock because patients are usually on two pressors, they're very sick, you give them steroids. steroids. If you look at this data, you might conclude that patients with more severe septic shock who are already receiving steroids would benefit from vasopressin. Uh, as opposed to patients with less severe septic shock who are not on steroids. This actually contradicts the previously uh, published data in the VAS trial itself. If, as we may remember, the VAS trial said vasopressin is more beneficial in less severe septic shock. The post hoc analysis is seeing it's more beneficial in more severe septic shock in patients who are already on steroids. So we're having two contradicting results from the same data from the same author that were published in just two separate studies. Another um, benefit that was mentioned of using catecholamine, of using vasopressin, is lowering the dose of catecholamine, and we're going to have a closer look at that. Um, from multiple sources, the dose of catecholamine that was proposed to be uh, beyond which there was, uh, there was a lot of side effects and toxicity is 0.6 microgram per kg per minute. If you look at the data from the VAST trial, the mean norepinephrine dose at randomization was only 0.27 microgram per kg per minute, and we're not quite sure that further lowering of this dose would add any benefit to the side effects of catecholamines. So that risk might have been low to start with, and we don't know if further lowering would lower the risk <coughs> anymore. Um, okay, something here. So I'm going to talk next about the hyponatremia in the vast trial, and um, patients are more likely. Um, excuse me a second. Just one slide before that. Um, we do know that patients are more likely to benefit from brazopressin mediated decrease in catecholamine dosage if they are severely sick, because that's um, where most of the deficiency of brazopressin is actually noted. Those patients are either expected to die in 12 hours or receiving vasopressin before even the studies started or have a high risk uh, cardiac disease. And all of these patients were actually excluded from the vast trial data. So this adds to the skepticism of using the data for the practice. Next, I will be talking about hyponatremia and vast trial, which is an often overlooked subject when discussing the study. And as we all know, hyponatremia is a frequent electrolyte abnormality, and incidence has been reported to be around 10% or so. The risk for hyponatremia and vast trial is particularly high because we have other risk factors as well, probably relative volume depletion and hypotension, especially early on in the study, and cardiac failure in high-risk cardiac patients uh, as well. And interestingly, only 0.3% of patients in the vast trial developed hyponatremia. That was only one patient out of about 400 patients who received vasopressin. That's quite a low of an incidence. Why is that? That has actually happened despite the fact that vasopressin treated group had an extremely high vasopressin levels, about 70 to 100 picometer per liter, whereas in normal individuals, it's usually less than 10 
And why is that? We don't really know. Apparently, um, a very effective way of preventing hyponatremia has been used by the author, which was not actually disclosed. And we don't know if that affected the outcome of the study ultimately. And it just might be a confounding factor that we don't really know about. Now, um, about the adverse effects of vasopressin, they're not really very well understood as much as other uh, vasoactive agents. We do have a lot of reported adverse effects, uh, mostly related to ischemia and vasoconstriction and different vascular beds, mesenteric myocardial, skin, hypernatremia as well due to the ADH nature of the vasopressin. Um, however, most of these studies are small, non-blinded. Um, trials of low-dose vasopressin infusion hasn't really been that convincing. And we also do know from biochemistry that vasopressin has another whole set of, of potential side effects uh, uh, because of the immune and inflammatory modulating responses or uh, nature of the vasopressin <coughs> itself. And we just don't know how does that affect the sepsis and septic shock itself. Those are the adverse effects that were reported in Vasterel. And as you can see, um, not a lot of, of uh, differences between vasopressin and norepinephrine groups. Um, as you can see down there, that hypnotism occurred only in one patient out of almost 400, which is quite low, and as already stated, we don't really know why is that. Now, as I, as I said, most adverse effects are related to the strong vasoconstrictive properties of vasopressin. It just depends on which side of the body we're talking about. Two major areas of concern are the heart and the spanking circulation. Uh, the data is really conflicting in spanking circulation. Heart ischemia is not uh, that of much of a concern because ischemia is reported at very high doses, but it is also reported when patients use central venous access for the vasopressin, which is a common practice um, as we see it in, in, uh, in our patients. Now, all this data is about from human uh, subjects. We don't really have a lot of human studies, and if they are there, they're not that convincing. So I looked a little bit further, and I looked at a couple of studies that used animals as their models. One particularly interesting study was using BEX to look at the side effects of using vasopressin and septic shock. Um, and they divided BEX into four groups, a control group, a group with vasopressin, septic group, and septic group with vasopressin. And particularly interesting were there's two figures, and as we already know from Vestal as well as other trials, that one, benef one proposed benefit of, of using vasopressin is that it has a kidney protective effect meaning it would in increase the creatine clearance and decrease the incidence of needing uh, dialysis. In this particular study, if you look at those two numbers, the septic group and the septic group treated with vasopressin, you can see that the study suggests lower renal blood flow to those organs in patients with septic shock, and those three uh, columns are columns over time. So the first one is the earliest one, and the last one is the latest one, and as you can see, uh, the renal blood flow actually did decrease when you compare both these groups. How clinically significant is this? We don't know, but this is just something to uh, note. Um, we think that vasopressin is renal protective. In fact, it might actually be uh, leading to a decrease in the blood flow with major adverse uh, consequences that comes afterwards. Another uh, interesting figure or result from this study was when you compare the arterial lactate concentration and that uh, did actually um, increase, as you can see, on patients who um, were treated with vasopressin, and this probably has to do with the fact that it's a major vasoconstrictor and decreases the blood flow. How much does this play a role in the development of multi-system uh, organ failure and the severity of sepsis? We don't know. It's just something that's worth mentioning. It's probably need to be studied better. And this is just the last figure I want to show from the study. And as you can see, the, um, when you compare the blood flow to certain vascular beds, it just decreases in many vascular beds when you give vasopressin as opposed to when you do not give vasopressin. So vasopressin is or might be associated with a generalized decline in the blood flow to different vascular beds with the possible complications from cystic that will ensue afterwards because of that. So in summary, um, adding vasopressin to catecholamine hasn't been benef proven to be beneficial to just the uh, catecholamine themselves. We do know that there might be some, some non-inferiority, if you will, and that it doesn't decrease the, uh, the immortality is not higher, but is it really beneficial? We just don't know for a fact. Um, evidence for using vasopressin as a sole agent is not actually established <coughs> at all. We just don't know if it's safe. We don't know if it's effective. 
and that studies were mostly small studies. You, really, you can't really tell from all of that. <coughs> and the side effects of using vasopressin are not very well understood. So um, whether you should use vasopressin or not, that's a matter of debate, but uh, based on the data that I've just reviewed, it's probably not just very well understood up to this point. And we have some data suggesting it might be even harmful in certain um, ways. So some of the references I used, and I just would like to thank Victoria Sain for helping me out uh, preparing this presentation, and that would be it. Any questions? What's the final recommendation? <laughs> <laughs>